I'm going to talk about a small group of a small but growing group of, of scientists, returners, um, and tell you what we're doing in the UK um, to try and address this hidden pool of talent. I'm the chief executive of the Daphne Jackson Trust, and I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the trust and, and what we do. So that quote um, just underneath my name there is something really that I had said, I can't remember when now, um, but it was really in response to everything that's been happening in the, in the pandemic. Um, and I think certainly we, all of us at the Trust have had to just instantly work, um, last March we had to instantly suddenly work virtually and remotely. We carried on as normal as much as we can. Um, and I think that shared sense of camaraderie with colleagues um, in the UK is something that we've really all noticed. And a new understanding and acceptance of really what it means, um, you know, work-life balance. And it's something that so many of us as mothers um, have dealt with over the years, you know, without a second thought, um, but it's uh, it's becoming a real issue for everybody. So this is me. Um, I am chief executive currently of the, of the trust, but I'm a nuclear physicist by profession. I moved into science communication. So I've been a science communicator and a science writer. I am um, a single mother to my adorable darling daughter, Holly, there, um, and, uh, and, and my dog, who actually, we're having a storm here in the UK, and I've just been having to cuddle him in the break because he hates, he's terrified of thunder. Um, and as of last year, um, I am now joint primary carer for my mother. So I can add that. My daughter's off at university, um, but five days into the lockdown last year, the first lockdown, my mother had a stroke and broke her ankle. And we live in a multi-generational household. So that's something I've now um, added to the list of things that, that I do. So our fellowships for returners. So, so this very briefly just says who we are. So in the UK, we are the only organisation that's solely dedicated to returners. And we're talking about returners who've had a break of two years or more, and it has to be taken for a family caring or health reason. Um, we simply offer fellowships. Um, they, we're moving towards them all being for three years rather than um, two or two or three years. Um, but what our fellowships offer that no other fellowship um, in academia offers is a combination of, of mentoring, support, guidance, advice, and retraining. And it's the flexibility that we offer with them is unrivaled because they are all um, absolutely bespoke. So um, we will look at what makes sense for the person. Um, our application process is quite lengthy, but it takes into account what people have done before their break, um, their personal circumstances and, and what they want to, um, to go back to. So just very briefly about Daphne, um, she was an amazing lady. Um, she was the first ever female physics professor in the UK when she was age 34. Um, she didn't have any children of her own, um, but she was a lifelong campaigner for women's rights. And she herself devised the scheme, the fellowship scheme while she was still alive. And in 1986, um, at um, picture was commissioned there but also that's the year when she first started offering fellowships and she offered and saw through 29 fellowships while she was alive. Um, she was actually my head of department so I knew her personally and she is she was quite a mentor to me in my career so the fact that I've now come back full circle and I'm running the organization that was set up after she died makes it so very personal um, to me and it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. So um, basically a quick run through of the trust. So in 1992, the year after Daphne died, the trust was set up because she left um, a wish that uh, the fellowships were continued after she died. She very sadly died of breast cancer and she was a research um, physicist researching on radiation. <coughs> so she knew exactly what was happening to her and she knew um, that she wanted these fellowships that she'd started to continue after she wasn't here anymore. So. Our fellowships are hosted um, at universities, research institutes and companies, basically any organisation um, where there's a significant amount of research undertaken. Um, we have the um, framework to facilitate the fellowship, but we don't pay for it um, because Daphne sadly wasn't a rich lady, didn't leave us with a large endowment or an enormous amount of money. So um, the fellowships are sponsored by um, organisations um, that have an interest in the research. Sponsors are in the UK include um, the, the UK Research Councils, which now come under UKRI, 
Um, that's UK Research and Innovation. And uh, there are seven research councils covering a variety of different um, subject areas. Um, universities that often act as hosts as well. Research institutes, charities like medical research charities and any other charities, um, some of the UK learning societies and also industry. Um, so it started off very modestly, um, manned by um, volunteers and maybe six or so fellowships were offered every year. Gradually, the trust has expanded. Um, I, crazily, it's, I can't believe it's this long ago. It was 2002 when I very first started doing some work for the trust, just one day a week on a freelance basis. But it was, um, so I've been with the trust or involved with the trust now for nearly 20 years. Um, in 2003, um, the scheme was expanded. So it wasn't just um, women who were offered the fellowships, it was men as well, although um, quite a small number, as you'll see later. Um, we are now fully inclusive of all researchers and we have, we've come a cropper a, a couple of times a little um, because of terminology and, you know, thinking about gender and um, you've got to really be careful now how you, um, how you have your wording on your websites, etc, to show that you're fully, fully inclusive of everything. In 2019, we expanded to offer fellowships in the Republic of Ireland as well as the UK. And last year, we expanded our remit to include arts, humanities and social sciences, as well as STEM areas. Predominantly, however, we've got one person coming through that's going to start in the arts um, this year. But predominantly, we are offering fellowships to women and to those in STEM. So we have a new offering this year that we're rolling out. We did a pilot scheme last year, and that is to offer a technology fellowship, um, which I'll just say very briefly something about in a moment. So overall, since 1986, um, we've awarded over 400 fellowships, It's actually about 437, I think, now. Um, and we have a phenomenally good success rate, game, which I'll say briefly about um, later. So our fellowships um, here, you can see our research fellowships on the left and the new technology fellowships that we'll be offering from next year, uh, from this year, sorry, um, on the right there. So. The research fellowships really do exactly that. They are aimed at returning somebody who started a promising research career back into that um, research career or into a research career in a different field. Um, the technology fellowships that we'll be offering um, perhaps don't require um, three years research experience after a, a STEM degree, but really they are aimed at reintroducing people to careers where um, there's far more of a broad retraining needed. So they're going to be more, um, about research support. There's an awful lot of organizations in the UK where there's a great deal of research support um, that is taking place. And we're having a bit of a, a real look in the UK at the moment at research culture. And the new chief executive of UK Research and Innovation is a, um, a lady who is really looking at, um, if you like, coming away from that whole idea of having um, a lone PI, a lone sort of genius and looking at everything to do with them. She's looking at every, the networks, everything that it takes um, to really progress in research. And that's looking at everyone, including all of those um, professionals that are offering research. So we're offering this at just the right time. But I'm just gonna concentrate mostly on our research fellowships because that's what we've been doing up until now. And um, we haven't got any technology fellowships. We're, even though we're rolling out the, the um, scheme as a new scheme this year, we don't have anyone um, doing that yet. Where I'm going to give statistics here, um, these are statistics that come from our last survey of former fellows actually back in 2015. We could have run, run another former fellows survey last year, but with the pandemic hitting just when we were about to do it, we decided it was a good idea to delay until this year. Um, but I can tell you pretty much, I think um, statistics are, uh, the statistics are around about um, the same, I would say, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual snapshot of the current fellows we have in post, but in terms of the um, of the schema of the little diagram you can see there, you can see clearly that the biological sciences and if you combine them, biological sciences and medical sciences are by far the, um, the largest sort of subject areas that we deal with. So we have 66 current fellows at the moment, um, um, of whom 34% are um, researching in, or 51%, sorry, 34 people, 51% are researching in bio and um, biomedical sciences. So thinking about our current fellows cohort at the moment, we've got 66 fellows who are across 40 host organisations. 
um, and 41 sponsors. So you can see the breakdown of sponsors there. Um, we have 30 of those fellowships that are fully sponsored by one organization and 36 that are, when we say matched sponsorship arrangements, it's possibly somebody who is hosted in a university and half sponsored by that university. And then we find them the other matching half sponsors for them. And that's usually um, the research councils. I use a lot of money um, from them to match with um, universities where we have the, the matching arrangements. So for the, um, Current fellows we have, you'll see that uh, 26 of them are on a three-year fellowship and 36 are on a two-year fellowship. But again, I mentioned flexibility earlier. One of them is on an 18-month um, fellowship that's 0. So normally our fellowships are 0.5 FTE, so they're part-time or, as I say, two or three years. Um, but we have one who's on 0. 0.75 for 18 months. And that's due to the sponsor needing to spend their money within um, the time limits on a research grant. We have, I'll talk about advertised sponsored fellowships and regular ones in a moment, um, but just to say that's the, the split there. And 12% of the fellowships, uh, current fellows are men. So predominantly we're offering fellowships um, to, to women. So our returners have quite a, a diverse profile actually. Um, so we do require a minimum of three years research experience. Um, the reason for the break is, is clear. And this is one that goes back to the integrity with which Daphne set up the scheme. The research, the career break from research has to be for family caring or health reasons. So predominantly we are offering fellowships to women who've had children, um, but we have a small but contin contin a small but consistent number of people for whom caring for an elderly relative or another relative is the reason for their break or for whom they've had problems with ill health. Um, the career break has to be at least two years. Um, and at the moment, the fellows have to be resident in the UK or in the Republic of Ireland um, with the right to, um, to work there. But this bit at the bottom where it says career breaks last from two to 21 years. The longest career break we have dealt with is a lady who had a break of 21 years. Um, she has now very successfully returned to a research career in a completely different field to the one that she was in prior to her break. Um, she's uh, quite uh, phenomenal, actually. What I would say though is the typical length of break that we're dealing with is five to eight years. Um, so, and it's interesting that um, somebody touched on, on an issue, I think it was either in the Q and A um, I saw earlier um, about what happens when you have more than one child. So one child, what we find typically, and this is really just a, a typical um, for us is that often people can manage one maternity leave and return to their career, no problem. It's when they have subsequent children that, um, Childcare gets too complicated and expensive, and that's when often people will actually take a break completely away from their research career. Sometimes thinking that there's no way to return, um, but they prioritise family over career, um, and then they find us and they're absolutely delighted to think that there's a way back in. We do have a small number of people for whom they knew about us already, and they thought, right, I can, when I have my children, take a break. I can take a complete break from my career and I can return back to it. And in that way, they feel that um, it's of much greater benefit to them because they have an opportunity to be with their children when they're young. Um, but they also know that there's an opportunity to return um, to a career uh, once they're ready. So, and you can see there from the last um, survey we did, a quarter of our fellows have nine years plus experience before they um, take their break. So I think we all know about the barriers to, um, I mean, obviously some barriers that the people face, barriers to returning. Um, however amazing a career somebody had before their break, if they've had a, a consistently long period of time away from the workplace, we find that they have lack of confidence. Um, it's incredible that there are people who are phenomenally talented and then they're questioning themselves. Um, and I mean, this is what we do. We, we help to put back some of that lost confidence. Some of the other barriers that we have had people telling us about are obviously lack of a recent track record. Um, lack of part-time and flexible posts and, and the availability in, in ch of childcare. Um, if for ill health, and I guess this would go probably for parenting as well, judging by some of the things that I've heard already spoken about today, a lack of understanding or tolerance of, um, of some of the issues. And another thing that we find that we can obviously manage with our fellowships is that previous experience may not be relevant to what they want to do. And an example of that is a lady who had a mathematics and statistics background 
had an eight year break to have children, but then realized um, when she was returning, and this was some years ago, that bioinformatics was an emerging field. She really wanted to use her maths and stats background to launch off into a career in bioinformatics. And our fellowships allowed her, the retraining part of the fellowship allowed her to um, learn enough of the biological sciences skills she needed to start and then progress in a career in bioinformatics after her Daphne Jackson Fellowship. So we're quite unique and we really are quite personal and our application process, as you can see here, we support the applicants at each stage and we look at what they've done before, what they want, what their career aspirations are. And I think it's this personally tailored approach to each fellow that allows us to have um, such a phenomenally good success rate with our fellows returning to careers. So we offer, uh, there are two ways to apply for a fellowship. The fellowship itself is the same, but we now enter into many more um, arrangements with organizations that are happy to sponsor fellowships. And then we advertise those opportunities. Um, you might find that the field of research or the location is specified. So if it's one, for instance, Durham University fully sponsored fellowships, obviously you've got to be in that, that area. Um, if it's somebody like Kidney Research UK who are sponsoring, then obviously it's got to be in that um, area. So we advertise, we assess um, all of the applicants um, for eligibility, and then we will send those who are eligible for a Daphne Jackson fellowship off to the um, sponsor who will um, select their preferred candidate or candidates to enter into our application process. So um, the other way that people can um, apply for and uh, receive a fellowship is to, if they, they know where they want to go and what they want to do, um, and they know where they want to go for their fellowship. So what we'll do then is just assess their eligibility and put them into the process. And that's where then we will find a suitable matching sponsor for them as they progress through the process. Um, our application process, like I said, it's it's pretty rigorous. It takes nine to 12 months from start to literally walking through the door and starting your fellowship. We're asking people to develop a draft proposal in conjunction with a, a proposed supervisor in a host organization. There's fine tuning of their research and retraining program. It, it, they go hand in hand, research and retraining. Um, we have a personal interview with them at quite an early stage. Um, their application is peer reviewed by two independent referees and they have a chance to respond to those. And then obviously everything is uh, sent off to our awards assessment panel. Um, each applicant has a de dedicated fellowship advisor. One of our staff who is um, there to give them one-to-one -one support and guidance and mentoring throughout the process and indeed throughout their fellowship. Um, so now moving on to the business case for returners, why should organizations get involved with return as well? They were qualified for the role in the first place, um, transferable skills. And I can't undress, I can't really um, stress this one enough. Career breaks, lengthy career breaks, heighten the skills required by employers. I mean, if you think about it, time management, conflict resolution, decision-making skills, you know, working under pressure and multitasking. Anyone who's been at home with small children knows, you know, all of those, all of those things, just literally, you, you, it hones your skills having having children and, um, and doing that. And what we want to do is, is get people to come back to the workplace and realize that all of the skills that they learned um, and heightened, you know, got heightened during their career break are really very, very valuable. Returners are generally extremely highly qualified and very experienced and motivated to return. And, you know, for many organizations that, you know, we work with, once they've had one Daphne Jackson fellow, they certainly want another one. There really are, um, hugely motivated um, once they've made that huge decision to return to a research career. So benefits of returners. Now, obviously, um, skill shortages um, are they're there and they're real. And what we offer with our um, fellowships is a, an opportunity for organisations to address skills shortages that they have. And I don't know how many of you, because obviously this is a global conference, heard of the, the term, the leaky pipeline. It's used a lot in the UK. Um, and basically, you know, you have a lot of people um, who start off in a profession and then leave. And, you know, I wonder whether, when Aaron talked about um, the effects of more than one child, I wonder why, I wonder whether, you know, basically you haven't got the information for those people because they probably left by the time they have three or four kids. Um, I mean, it could be. Um, but obviously what we do is 
we say that our fellowship, our fellowships, they, we can't guarantee you a job after the fellowship, but what we'll guarantee is that we take away the disadvantage of your career break. And we really do return talented professionals back to appropriate careers at the right level. So um, I'm running out of time. In fact, I think I've run out of time. So I'm not gonna talk too much about um, any of these um, examples of um, successful fellows, only to say that um, we have eight of our former fellows who've moved on to become professor. Um, and you'll see that they're not all in research, but some of them are in research support um, or who've moved into um, other areas, maybe um, working in industry. Um, if anyone wants to know more about um, our fellowships, these are just some stats from before which um, see nine out of 10 fellows stay in long term in a STEM career. And nine out of 10 say that their fellowship helped them secure their subsequent jobs. So we've got um, a tremendous um, success rate. Um, this is my team. So um, what I would say is if you want to find out any more about us, um, all of the stats um, that I've put in this presentation are in a report that's on our website. Look at our website. Um, this is my team. They're amazing. Um, there are 12 of us and we work the equivalent of 6.95 FTE. I'm the only staff member who is full time. The rest of them work part time contracts. And I think for a small team, we have a tremendous um, reputation and reach in the UK um, with regard to um, returners. And oh, there's so much more I can say, but I won't because I'm, I think I have, I've hit my time limit. Um, but what I would say one thing is please look at um, the video, our video on our website. There's a link to it on our homepage and it will really bring to life what I've been saying in the presentation. Um, and I mean, there were a couple of other things I was going to say about the culture of research in the UK and how it's becoming more family friendly and more friendly towards people that are not on that one track sort of um, traditional career trajectory. And one of them is um, the Athena Swan Charter, um, which is something that's really um, has been, and it's being rolled out in other countries now. So some of you may have heard about it, um, but that's something, and I can put some links in the Q and A and in the chat um, afterwards. And the other thing is a, it's an initiative called Resume for Researchers, and it's being run by the Royal Society at the moment, but the main big funding body in the UK, the UKRI, are looking at rolling out a resume for researchers. And what it does is it takes away that reliance on number of publications. It allows you to, um, to do a resume that really will look in a lot broader. Basically, you talk about, um, your contribution to knowledge, your contribution to the development of other individuals, um, the wider research community, the broader society. And it's really intended to um, allow people who've had breaks in their um, career or who've had maternity leaves um, to really be um, viewed on a level playing field with everybody else out there. So I think that's a fantastic initiative. But I'd be very happy for anybody to contact me um, later on during the day, um, during this meeting or at other times. So please um, take down um, our details and um, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure um, to be able to speak today.